Okay, so uh, welcome back everyone for the afternoon session. So we've got some great more um, panels, uh, a bit of film, um, some really interesting talks for the rest of the afternoon. So we talked a lot about big data and data building and some of the other initiatives and the milestones to date. We're going to talk a bit more widely as well about um, the broader issues and challenges in medicine in relation to malaria this afternoon. Um, and we're going to begin then with um, a short keynote from Ken Staley from the President's Malaria Initiative in the US, um, who's been involved, amongst other things, in the control efforts, not only in Africa, but also in the greater Mekong, um, and reports to the USAID, USAID administrator. Ken, over to you. Thanks very much. Please don't, don't get up. <laughs> um, Look, we're here today because of two reasons. First, because MMV has provided drugs that are now reaching patients who need them the most and saving lives. And second, because there is a pipeline of promising candidates that will do the same thing in the next decade and beyond. And those two things make me very bullish about eradicating malaria within our lifetimes. Now, when it, comes to, when it comes to data and why we need to use it, what I want to do is provide you a brief context, talk to you about why data in the context of drug delivery is so critical, and then finally tell you a little bit about what we've been doing over the last year and invite you to be part of that. So first, some quick context. Between 1979 and 2000, the progress against malaria control and elimination uh, was almost nil. Since the turn of this century, as all of you know, we've seen tremendous progress. 20% of countries that were endemic at the turn of the century have now eliminated. Another 20% are on the pathway to elimination. 30% have less than a million cases per year, and another 30% have more than a million cases per year, and count malaria as one of their most significant societal challenges. I have the privilege of leading the President's Malaria Initiative, and we focus on that 30%. Over the last 15 years, we've partnered with 27 national malaria control programs that represent about 90% of the world's malaria burden, and dedicated $8 billion in resources to technical expertise, implementation in partnership with NMCPs, and the purchase of life-saving commodities. Now, since our inception in 2006, the world has seen tremendous progress in the areas where we work. The graph you see right now goes from orange to blue. Hotter is more malaria. Cooler, blue is more. Uh, cooler, more, blue is less. But what we've, what we've seen in recent years is a more heterogeneous uh, result pattern. Places like Uganda, just in the last three months, have announced astounding progress, going from 17% prevalence to 9% prevalence in just three years. Other countries like Mozambique have faced tremendous challenges. That's led some people to question where we're going with our control and our eradication efforts. Now, I had the pleasure of being part of the uh, Lancet Commission on Malaria Eradication. We released our report just a few months ago. One of our key conclusions is that malaria eradication within our lifetime is possible. But another one of our conclusions is that what we've done so far needs to change because what's gotten us here won't get us to the end. And one of the keys for us will be data. Making more data available, sharing that data, and then executing based on that data. So, how can we start thinking about data? Well, for me, it's quite simple. We're an operational organization in the field with almost 1,000 people in 27 countries. We need to make sure that we have the right drug in the right place at the right time. So let me give you a very specific example of where data becomes critical for us and where we know, as a result of our efforts over the last 12 months, we can be better than we were last year. All of you are familiar with seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis. It's quite simple, actually. 
We go to places where malaria is seasonal, and we try to give four doses of anti-malarials to kids under five to make sure they don't get malaria during peak transmission season. So, how do we do that? Well, the first thing we can do is we can look at an epi curve. Now, with the data we're aggregating, we can also layer on weather patterns. And with those two pieces of data, we can then start to think about when a campaign needs to start. Once we know when the campaign starts, we can, know, we can start thinking about when we need to deliver the commodities to the point of execution, and that's two weeks before. We also need to think about when we need to get the commodities to the country itself. We know that's actually six weeks before the campaign starts because we need to make sure we can clear customs and address any quality control issues that we have. Now, we also know that it's going to be 48 weeks before the campaign starts that we need to start production. And we know that even a month before that, we're going to need to be placing our order, thinking about donor commitments, shelf life, and stock on hand. Now, all of that together means we're going to save a life. And we know that we can improve on what we do now. Sometimes we start campaigns a little late. Sometimes the drugs aren't in the right place at the right time. But by aggregating all this data together, we can actually make much more accurate predictions of how we can deliver that right drug to the right place at the right time. Now, in the malaria community, just as in many other communities, we've had siloed data for quite some time. Sometimes imperfect, but oftentimes siloed and, and very, very rarely shared. Our goal over the last year and in the coming years is to break those silos down. So, there are a number of ways that our integrated data can provide value. First, we can actually figure out where we need to target better. We can also think about where we can do better training. We can think about how supply chain surety can be enhanced. We can actually think also about what types of drugs are needed where. The bottom line, Data sharing can enhance dramatically the way in which we operationalize products that are produced by people in this room. And that's critical for us as we try to bend the curve further toward eradication. Now, I've told you a little bit about why the current context calls for more data sharing. I've also told you, I've also given you a few examples of why data is so important for, our, for us very, in very concrete terms. Let me tell you about what we've done over the last year. So first, we've integrated at the global level. Along with our colleagues at the Global Fund, we represent about 90% of external funding for malaria eradication around the world. We've taken it upon ourselves to harmonize all of our financial terms and integrate our supply chain data. That's different than we've had any time in the past. That means this year when the Global Fund grants go out, people will have a comprehensive picture of how aid is being spent in countries. It's a big step forward for us in terms of allocating resources efficiently. We're also partnering at the local level. So with NMCPs over the last 12 months, we've been collecting data on a quarterly basis from routine systems and integrating it with global data in order to provide visualizations and dashboards for management. We're just at the beginning of our journey, and we all know that we need to develop capacity. So in order to develop that capacity, we have about 20 data scientists now at the President's Malaria Initiative who are working to create a shared platform for data integration and visualization across a number of different data streams. And in addition to that, in each of our 27 countries, we're embedding a PMI data scientist with the NMCP to help, to help enhance data quality and data use over time. Now, we have a long way to go, and we've just, taken, we've just started taking steps to share that data and to break barriers down. But I want to actually make sure that we all understand what our target ought to be. Our target ought to be open data. We ought to be thinking about data as a common global good, one that actually is shared because we all have a shared goal of eradication. Now, the polio eradication campaign, I think, gives us quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of data for us to ponder. In 2012 at the World Health Assembly, there was an emergency resolution on polio eradication. Among its critical uh, components was a call to share data more effectively. By 2013, there was a global compact on data sharing. Imperfect, but much better than, than polio had ever been able to accomplish in the past. 
Much of the progress that's been, uh, that's been occurring in polio eradication since, I believe, is because of that programmatic and epidemiological data sharing. We in the malaria community can do just as well and even better. So I'm here today to tell you a little bit about how you can get involved. First, I think it's all of our duty to go and talk about why data is so critical to our effort and why open data is so critical for us in the, into the, into the, uh, in the coming months and years. And second, I want to invite every one of you to talk to me and talk to anyone you know about ways that we could share data better. We're building a platform right now. We welcome collaboration, and we welcome everyone in this room to, uh, to join us on the journey. So thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ken. It's interesting to hear this kind of increasing evolution towards um, data and software alongside um, the hardware, as it were, of drugs, diagnostics, nets, and so on is becoming increasingly important in global health work. So we're going to move now to a session to talk very much about endemic country solutions. And we're going to have a series of short presentations and then uh, hopefully some time for a little bit of discussion as well, um, building up on that. Um, so we have Elizabeth Chizema, um, uh, a very long-standing, very experienced malaria manager who's now um, working both for the African Leaders Malaria Alliance and also Zambia's own N Malaria Council. Um, Elizabeth, let's start with you. Actually, I'll move here. So I'll talk about the long last mile and the challenges that we continue to face. So really taking it into context of a Zambian situation is that we have trained community health workers to make a diagnosis of malaria using rapid diagnostic tests and to be able to treat uncomplicated malaria with ACTs. Unfortunately, when malaria becomes severe, there remains a gap at community level because we cannot treat a very sick child or with oral medication. And when severe malaria is left untreated, the result is quickly leads to death. And for Zambia, we have seen quite a lot of barriers to access to the services, especially for severe malaria. Amongst this is that people are unaware of the signs and symptoms of severe malaria. And a lot of the severe malaria then remains, uh, is not reported or it's missed at community level. We also have uh, health seeking behaviors that really make people not come to the health service. As well as the long distance, you can see the terrain in our remote uh, rural areas of Zambia, where it may take up to two hours to reach a nearest health facility using a bicycle and there's also lack of transport and a poor road network. We also noted that even at, at the health center level, we did not have adequately trained health staff as well as non-availability of medication for severe malaria. And therefore, working together, we came up with innovative strategies of a community-driven approach to mobilize access to malaria treatment in the very remote, hard-to-reach areas of Zambia and working with MMV support financially and technically with also all the other partners, including the district health management team, the National Malaria Program, and the other partners, we came up with a pilot study to show that severe malaria could be managed at least before referral at community level. And therefore, what was our approach? We looked at community interventions, we looked at health facility intervention, as well as collaboration at the district level and the national level. So we're able to train community health workers, really looking at the low literacy levels. We looked at the appropriate way of training community health volunteers to be able to identify signs of severe malaria and be able to administer rectal test unit and quickly refer the patient to the nearest facility using trained emergency transport system of, bus, of ambulance, uh, bicycle ambulance riders to then support the mother or the parents or the caregiver to go to the nearest facility where they were able to access a trained health uh, worker and available uh, injectable test unit for severe malaria. 
We also tried to raise awareness in the communities because a lot of the children were left unattended to or untreated in the community level. And we ensured that both rectal attestinate and injectable attestinate were readily available at the health facility. And we looked at eight health facilities in a rural district called Serenje, and we were able to look at, and we reached about 54,000 uh, community members. So what are some of the achievements or results? Really, there was a remarkable reduction in mortality in the under five children, with a reduction you heard yesterday of a re reduction in the death rate of severe malaria of 96%. We also noted that knowledge le uh, levels improved both by the community members themselves as well as the volunteers and the health workers. You will also note that all those children who were diagnosed with severe malaria were able to be referred to the health facility where they received uh, appropriate treatment for severe malaria management and were able to, ref to give feedback back to the community about how they were treated. We also noted if you look at the time before uh, training for severe malaria management, very few cases of severe malaria were being diagnosed. But over time, our, our uh, pilot started in July 2017 and ended in July 2018. You will note from the graph that severe malaria diagnosis increased, so we're able to identify all those children that were being missed in the community. However, the mortality reduced. Previously, about 18 children died in a year. During the study, three children died, but with increased number of the diagnosed cases of severe malaria. And what are our next steps? Really working in partnership, we've now been able to scale up uh, the project to cover three additional districts. So we are now in four districts, and we plan to also scale up to the fifth district. In addition, the Ministry of Health has now introduced rectal attestinate in the policy and is committed to scale up nationwide. And we are integrating these in already existing systems instead of developing parallel systems where we are really looking at the national ICCM uh, programs to ensure long-term sustainability. And as usual, financial resources are required to be able to scale up. And I'm happy to report that as a country, we have now set up an initiative with support from African Leaders Malaria Alliance and the RBM Partnership to End Malaria to set up the End Malaria Council, where we are really looking at mobilizing resource for malaria, advocating to prioritize malaria, and ensuring that we implement our plans and remain accountable. So we are hopeful that we will very soon be able to reach the whole country. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I know from being there myself that you've done a great job in scaling up the commitment, even with limited resources. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go across the four speakers and then come back for discussion. So let me now turn to Palu uh, Danani, Managing Director of Universal Corporation in Kenya, which was he built from 1996 and now is providing 144, is that right, uh, of patent generic drugs, including antiretrovirals and indeed antimalarials. Yep. Thank you. Good afternoon. So we're going to give a small brief on what is Universal. Um, it's a quality company based in Kenya. And today, these are the things we're going to talk about. Uh, MMV's local support for, uh, support for local production. I think this is the first time it has happened. It's in Africa, for Africa. And I guess, like Kelly said in the morning, it's time that we maybe look at such things because it's very clear that wherever the product is made available near the problem, Access is always better. So we're just going to talk about some, uh, I'm going to talk about some issues that we have, how to empower Africa, what are the initiatives we have taken, a few factory overview and history, and the manufacturing capabilities, including the quality management system. Uh, I think this is something we all know, this is a collaboration between us and an Indian company, uh, Rena, together with, in collaboration with MMV for the dispersible sulfadoxin pyrimethamine for IPTP. I don't want to bore with the rest of the data. I think most of you are aware of this. Uh, in addition to that, we have the other products that we are going to submit for PQ submission uh, later on in the year, up to March or April next year. 
and getting approvals for the malaria, including some ARVs. These are only, I mean, one ARV and the rest are malaria products. So we know that majority of the deaths happen, 90% are in Africa. And there are only two or three manufacturers who are able to supply as at now. I guess we need some help in how to develop the continent where the problem is, uh, not only for malaria, but maybe the other TB and HIV as well. There are key challenges as an African manufacturer. One is skilled, experienced resources. We have a lot of brain power in terms of manufacturing in Africa. The only problem is to get them to document all the issues is a big gap. That's what we're trying to fix. The regulatory compliance, there are too many inspections. I think we receive almost 20 inspections in a year. And most of the year round, you're on just in inspection mode. And the support to Africa. I mean, we have had good support in terms of the UN organizations recently signed a pact to support local manufacturing. But everything is looked at about in price only, forgetting that certain, men, I mean, majority of the Eastern countries do have some export benefits given to their exporters. And sometimes, because of 1% to 5%, we actually lose a contract. And that one to 5% does not help in developing capacity. As an example is, today, there, as I say, there were no AL manufacturers in that part of the world. And right now, there is a lot of product available in the market which is not regulated, or rather, we don't know the quality of that, but it is going to bring challenges. All the hard work taken Let's hope it doesn't go to waste and come back with substandard product and all that. So as an example, I just mentioned this, there are some levies that we are charged by our own governments, which I think government will look at, but there are also subsidies. So at the word go, we are already 7 to 17% more expensive than our counterparts outside the continent. Um, so as... I think these are some normal things. But when donor funds eventually dry up, like in terms of uh, malaria, there is a lot of self-sustainability they're asking for. But the capacity is really not being built. Maybe somehow we need to see how we can build capacity in Africa so for the long-term benefit of the patients. So what have we done as an initiative to tackle the resources program. We have a future leaders program that's going on, which brings people from tier two to tier one, or tier three to tier two, which has a lot of benefits in terms of uh, skills, skill building. That's just a quick photograph of what we started a year ago, and uh, six modules that we want to go, the people to go through. We also have started a trainee program to cover the skills gap. So we start people at, we identify the people, select, train, empower, develop the skills, and we get a full resource. So we started this program two years ago, and the few of the trainees that were on board. We start with every section. It's not only in QA or QC, it's all these people. So we started with 78 recruits. Today we have 51. 27 have left, at least 27 have left, have all found a better job. And we could not absorb them because it's a training program and all these trainees have actually benefited by getting a better job when we cannot onboard them. The first thing they ask you on your CV is what is the experience you have? So all these trainees have actually got a job outside Universal. And our way forward after the training program is to optimize all the resources uh, review, simplify all the procedures and get all time readiness for delivery. And I mentioned this, that whatever product is manufactured nearer the cause, it's always delivered on time. And there are so many examples we can give you from Kenya that we have supplied goods in a very short time. Like delivery to Zambia, it's 10 days, Malawi is seven days, Rwanda, Burundi a day. Whereas if it's from outside the continent, which has currently been happening, it takes a long time. And as we saw, sometimes you have to plan a year in advance. 
but this can be done in phases. We, stocking will not be there, and a lot of economic other benefits will come in through. Quickly, a quick site overview, and a, what we started from was a very small facility in 1996. In 2004, we started building from a greenfield. 2005 and 2008, FinFund uh, invested in UCL, which took us to the first WHO pre-qualification program. So it's since 2011 that we have been pre-qualified. So it's not something that is not sustainable. We have sustained it for eight years. And going ahead, we merged with Strides, a company from India, in 2016. And we have technology transferred some products from Strides to Universal in 2018 and currently go ongoing. A quick uh, site thing. So these are all the regulatory approvals we have. Um, in, and I really want to thank institutions like WHO, UNICEF, USAID, who have supported in procuring from Universal. But in majority of these cases, it's only as an emergency supplier when things are out of stock. So if we need sustainability, we need to see some better uh, to invest more into quality. These are one, some of our key customers I mentioned. Thanks to all of them for where we are today. And I think going future, we should be able to, and there are a few more UN organizations signed off in May this year to support local manufacturing. And a quick brief is this is our capacity um, in terms of site. Uh, employee strength about 328, and those are our capacities on a single shift operation. So there is enough capacity to serve a number of these products within the region. And we have, I think we are the only, maybe amongst the only African manufacturers that have a IT-enabled quality management system almost in every aspect of uh, the, the QMS needed in pharma industry. Thank you. Thanks, Palu. And so now, uh, Gonzalo Domingo, um, who heads the Malaria Diagnostics Partnership at PATH. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about um, diagnostic tests that provide access to um, drug treatment to malaria case management. Um, the first breakthrough we had in malaria for laboratory-confirmed diagnosis of malaria was microscopy when Alphonse Lavaran um, first observed the parasite in the red blood cell under a microscope. It's important to recognize that the microscope is still a very valuable technology and very valid and robust technology to use um, in, in malaria endemic countries and still the mainstay. And then nothing happened until the 1990s with the development of the lateral flow test and the discovery of um, malaria antigens that we could use as diagnostic markers. And this was a significant breakthrough. Um, but we had problems initially in the great program by WHO and FINE really tried to resolve the quality problems of these tests and helped push forward the adoption to the level that we just heard Elizabeth talking about how it's the mainstay for diagnosis of malaria in Zambia and many other countries. Um, now, in the 21st century, actually a lot has happened and the private sector have come forward and made new research use only and um, diagnostic platforms, including more sensitive tests for from malaria on the, on, the on the rapid test, um, on the RDT platform, but actually also molecular diagnostic tests that allow us to look at um, malaria infection below that pyro pyrogenic level and understand the epidemiology um, better um, in, in areas that we're trying to eliminate malaria. Um, so it's a very exciting time from the perspective that we have tools to really understand what's going on and um, measure these new strategies that we're looking at to eliminate malaria or reduce um, the burden of malaria in countries. Um, still, our limitation, though, and it's important to, to, to recognize that, is that we still don't test enough people with microscopy and with the current RDTs to treat them properly. And until we do that more effectively through innovations that Elizabeth, for example, just ex explained, um, we're not going to be able to realize the, the impact of these new tools that we're developing. Another case where um, access is limited by the kind of diagnostic tools and, and, and options that we have is for case management of Plasmodium vivax. Um, Plasmodium vivax as a parasite, the, the challenge we have is that it can hide in the liver and then come out sequentially in these new bouts of, of, of 
um, sickness called relapses, and each bout, bout of re, each relapse can actually lead to further deterioration of um, of the patient and um, an accumulated accumulated morbidity and mortality actually equivalent to plasmodium falciparum. And the only drugs that can cure this aren't the typical antimalarial drugs that cure the blood stage parasites, but actually are based off um, from this class of drugs, the atominoquinoline. We have had a drug that can um, actually eliminate the parasite from the liver, um, primaquin, since the 1950s. But the challenge is that it's either a 14-day regimen, and there's a couple of seven-day regimens that are, are used. But from an adherence perspective, you heard earlier today, that's actually very challenging to implement. And what we've, we have now have um, quite compelling data to show that if you don't do um, directly observed or, or if you just give out the primaquine dose, the efficacy or, or the effectiveness of, of primaquine is the same as not giving primaquine at all. So we're seeing a, a considerable challenge in getting that drug out. Um, in 2018, you heard earlier, actually, GSK and MMV um, collabor collaboratively got through the FDA and TGA a single day, um, a single dose regimen um, for curing um, Plasmodium vivax, and that's a real game changer. In 2019, now you heard that actually there was a press release last this month that it was um, first registered in a malaria endemic country, Brazil. The challenge with these drugs, though, um, is that they can cause um, severe hemolysis in people with an enzyme deficiency called G6PD deficiency. And unfortunately, the prevalence of that condition overlaps very nicely with malaria and um, endemicity. So areas that have high burden of malaria actually also have high burden of G6PD deficiency. To add that complication to that, the tests that we use to diagnose that typically are very complex. These are laboratory-based tests. Actually, in the US and um, in Europe, those tests are done only in very centralized clinical laboratories. Um, and so <clears throat> you're not <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> it's okay, thanks. No, it's okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're not going to get access to those drugs <clears throat> unless you can reduce that to a point of care, <clears throat> point of care test that um, is affordable and actually can work challengingly for an enzyme across multiple temperatures. And this year we saw actually the first product get ERPD approval that allows countries to use global fund, um, funds to purchase it. And there's more products coming online um, to, to be able to take this testing to the last mile and also therefore make primaquine and tofenaquine available. We still have to do some work to get this test through the stringent regulatory authority approval and WHOPQ, but it's very exciting that we now have a single day um, drug regimen for curing Plasmodium vivax and a test and more coming that um, will support getting this test out to the, to the last mile. Again, all of that has to be supported by innovation in um, operations and, and, and um, ways of getting this, these technologies out to um, those who need it most. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the water. Thank you, Professor Jean-Louis Ndiaye. Did I get it right? Professor of Parasitology in Dakar, Senegal. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, uh, first of all, I want to thank MMV for inviting me to this uh, very uh, relevant event, celebrating the 20 years, but also asking me to share my experience about seasonal malaria chemo prevention, uh, particularly in Senegal, where we are conducting this up to 10 years old. So SMC, uh, is um, intermittent administration of two uh, very old drugs, sulfadoxin pyrimetamine and amodaikin, uh, at a therapeutic dose in order to reduce malaria illness and death. I mean, for the first time, we have a very effective tool in that prevention packages, and it's really well tolerated, but also it's well accepted by the communities. 
Uh, why that? Because it's a community-based intervention. It's delivered door to door, and the communities have been able to touch the direct benefits of its efficacy because we heard a lot of stories of mothers who was just explaining that since the beginning of this implementation, they are feeling more safe, they are feeling even more free because they are not going back to back to, back to the um, clinics, bring their sick children, and they have also more time to go to the field works and so. So since the WHO recommendation in 2012, uh, most eligible countries have quickly adopted and implemented this strategy. In 2014, we have eight countries which cover 2.5 million children, and now we reach 13 countries with nearly 18 million children covered by this strategy. So we have documented that this strategy could reduce up to 60, between 60 to 80 percent of malaria cases and between 45 to 60 percent of malaria deaths. So it's very, very effective. My country, Senegal, is the only one who is delivering this strategy up to 10 years old. The reason is, uh, Ken was saying about the importance of data. So we've been able to document that children for, from five to nine years old was also suffering for severe disease, but also were dying from malaria. So that's why we uh, work since the beginning with the National Malaria Control Program, but also the Minister of Health, and we tried to, to the beginning, we went beyond the WHO recommendation, which just recommended strategy to under five. And we also show that given this strategy up to 10 years old was also very effective, and we also reached high coverage. So now, Modeling studies has also shown that if we increase this strategy, if we give this strategy to the five to nine, we'll increase the impact and we'll reduce more, uh, uh, more cases and more deaths. And if you're going, expanding the SMC up to 10 years old, up to 10 years old also, increase the indirect benefits about threefold. So it's really important now to push the boundaries to increase the impact. In Senegal, we conducted SMC combined with community case management, and we show also by adding one cycle to, that, to the fourth cycle recommended, we bring more protection. Because when we are targeting four, more, four months of treatment, uh, we are targeting like 60% of malaria the transmission. But when we add one cycle, due to a lot of challenge of countries sometimes didn't know when to start, when to stop, so when you increase the time, the timing, maybe you will cover more, uh, bring more protection, and it will be for the benefits of the entire population, particularly in the young children. So my appeal is, what are you waiting for? If we are targeting this old asylum ban, we have nearly 70 million of children under 10 years old. We have the drugs, which is very effective, so we need to push the countries to really collect data to show the evidence that it could be increasing, the age range could be increased, but also the epidemiology could be better, understand and better understood and we cover more the transmission season. So this is my message this afternoon and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much. Uh, so we've, we've um, got a few minutes for discussion and we had a number of um, questions that we selected already based on uh, submissions from different folks. Um, maybe let's start with a high level one, which is really, so we're reflecting on 20 years of MMV. So over that time period, what have you all individually identified as perhaps the biggest single thing that was missing or that was hampering access to medicines to tackle, deliver, uh, tackle malaria? Jean-Louis, maybe, you want to start? Let me say again. What's the biggest single hindrance that you've seen that's blocked better access to um, treatment for malaria? 
somebody told us this morning about maybe money, uh, because uh, um, we started, for example, this, this strategy, uh, seasonal medical prevention, and we went forward before the manufacturers came on board. So we are facing some stock out, and country wanted, even some, now, some countries want to go beyond, but they don't have enough support to order enough tablets, for example. So the other point could be also how to better analyze the urine profile, the epidemiology of malaria in their country, and to know who are really the, the hard-to-reach uh, children or hard-to-reach population, and to find a way to go there and, uh, uh, and to really expand the health system to reach all those uh, fragile population. Okay, Gonzalo. I think, um, as I mentioned, um, we have to, to detect malaria cases. We have the right technologies with the RDTs and microscopy. So it is really about strengthening the systems to get out to those people who are suffering from malaria. I think we, in many countries, the gap between estimated cases of malaria and confirmed cases of malaria is still way too big. And you know we can come up with new technologies, but until we narrow that gap, that's going to be a limitation to the impact we can have with any intervention. And there's a big structural gap, isn't there? Because you know, you're, even if you've got a treatment, but then your diagnostic comes up negative, then what do you do next? I mean, is there anything more that can be done to think about the systems rather than simply the technologies and diagnostics that would help improve access to care? I think that's a good point, and I'll hand it over. But Ken was talking about data, and the more we understand about what that gap is, how many people aren't coming up positive for malaria, and, and the more we understand um, what that, how that influences treatment, that's, you know, we need that information to be able to then inform smarter um, treatment algorithms for fever, for fever management. Palu. Um, my view is excess is limited due to logistics, could be a major concern. In Africa, I think our tendering systems are also very long. Sometimes they're done on emergency basis, and to get product on emergency basis is not as easy when you're doing it outside the continent. So my view would be even manufacturing where the problem is could help reduce a lot of excess issues. And you talked about uh, even cases where non-pre-qualified medicines from elsewhere were being used uh, in, in contrast to yours, for example. What more needs to be done then to develop perhaps local production or purchasing of medicines that are produced locally? Uh, okay, quality is one key which we should not forget. So problem in all these uh, programs, 90% of all the funding that is for the three pandemics, HIV, malaria, and um, uh, TB, is donor funded. And majority of these manufacturers are outside the continent. In Africa, I think there are only two pre-qualified manufacturers. So uh, more needs to be done in terms of guiding them through on how to build capacity locally. So if, if we can manage to do that, I think it will bring a lot of disease burden down in not only these, but even the NCDs that we are talking about. And uh, somehow some, some solution needs to be found. And I think there's a lot of drive towards that right now. Um, USAID, UFR, uh, UN bodies, they're all looking at towards local manufacturing. Unfortunate bit is I think the guidelines are still not yet set on how to do that uh, last mile to develop that into Action. Okay, Elizabeth. The well, big thank box. you. <laughs> thank you very much. I think uh, I think in terms of development, a lot really goes into that. But I think for me, the challenge is really getting the medicine to the patient at the right time, and basically the quality assured medicine. And thanks to the pilot study that we did with MMV were able to come up with innovative strategies to ensure that right at the community level, the children were able to access the medicine and then were able to be transferred. So really that community approach supported the program and not just looking at the medicine alone, but really also looking at the barriers that uh, delay the access to the service. 
a community approach. And Kenya, maybe a final reflection from you, seeing a number of these different endemic countries and how PMI is strategizing around where to prioritize support. Sure. So, I mean, look, I think the first thing I would say is in 19 years, we've made tremendous progress, right? So it's, it's hard to say that there's one specific driver from the past, but let me look forward and say I think there's two buckets I'd place this in. The first, from a systems perspective, is data and management. Those two things go together like, like peanut butter and jelly, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you've got to do both to increase, increase access over time. The other, though, and you see Elizabeth wearing the, the, uh, the wristband, I mean, zero malaria starts with me isn't just a slogan. It, it actually means that every one of us individually, if we're going to eradicate, has to take a particular action. Whether that's someone who lives in an endemic country and sees a neighbor with a, a, a child with fever and encourages them to seek care sooner. Or it's someone who's part of the broader malaria community and who thinks about ways that they can make sure that malaria stays on the, the global agenda. Well, great. Well, um, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but uh, do please thank our panelists for a great session. And now drawing on those lessons, I'm going to ask uh, George Jago, um, who's the Executive Vice President for Access and Product Management at MMV, for some reflections on what we've heard, the successes in the field and the challenges going forwards. I'm not this oh, yeah. clicker works. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just to thank you, as everyone else on my team has done, for joining us for this celebration, which is a celebration of our collective work. I'm in the interesting role of having to try and synthesize somewhat schematically a lot of different anecdotes and observations you've heard today, many of which have been excellent. And so I just, I hope I can do justice to what you've been hearing. And also there were additional questions that some of you were kind enough to email to us. In the eight minutes allotted to me, I hope I'll touch on answers to most of them, but feel free to grab me uh, at coffee um, if, if I've not correctly uh, addressed the questions you had. So today you've heard everything from drug discovery, translating drugs from phase one to phase two, and then it's David kindly attributes to me, but it's actually an organizational philosophy, that final step of making these compounds into medicines that reach patients. So what I'm speaking about briefly today is this section on the left, where you can see in our continuum of where we want to go in the future for right now, truthfully in the control space, where many countries still are dealing with the heavy burden of malaria, dealing with unacceptable quantities of disease and death. The team that MMV has generated around access focuses on uncomplicated, severe malaria, relapsing or vivax, and this last category, which really came to us somewhat late in, in chemo prevention. But across those four dimensions, we are continuously asking ourselves, are the products that we're developing doing the right job? Are they being deployed where they need to go? And what are the obstacles that might stop them from delivering on maximum life-saving impact? That's the driving question for the access team at MMV and our partners in the field. This is a schema or a, di a diagram of the lily pads that we hop across when we look at any drug that we've developed to ask ourselves, Will it deliver impact on that child in the center? And again, themes you've heard today, financing and affordability. Thank you, Jean-Louis, for pointing out money matters. Um, manufacturing and supply. Again, I'd pick up on Palu's comments. Manufacturing locally, manufacturing affordably, and always manufacturing to international quality standards. An old mantra that MMV that's carried through to today is no second class medicines for citizens anywhere in the world. Normative guidance, you heard that earlier today, that as WHO stands in a position to orient countries, it's important for us to make sure that WHO understands what it is they're looking at as our drugs mature through the drug development pipeline. User acceptance means a lot of things. User acceptance means, will healthcare providers having to administer the drugs understand how to use them safely? User acceptance means, will mothers at home be able to actually open day two and day three of treatments and use them correctly. And ultimately, user acceptance means will the child putting the medicine in his or her mouth spit it out 
or not. User acceptance is really important for understanding if we're gonna be able to deliver at that very last moment drugs that people will willfully, voluntarily take. Regulatory approvals, you've heard a lot about that. And it is important in the context of local manufacturing that we understand local regulators can be enabling partners for local manufacturing to hit international standards. If local regulators embrace the notion of no second tier medicines, they help, will help drive the bar higher for quality medicines manufactured locally or internationally. Market size and demand forecasting is something that matters a lot to our manufacturing partners. Recently, because MMB has had 20 years of working in this space, we actually have companies saying to us, what will the market be like? What should we think about? How much should we think of manufacturing? Which we find amusing because in the past we were chasing the big pharma companies' forecasting departments, but now they're looking to us because we've cultivated a knowledge of what should be the likely trajectory of medicines. And medical education is critical. So MMV has a strong medical department, very committed to being present in a number of settings, facing country program managers, facing country policy makers, and actually working with clinicians to explain how medicines get used. The role of medical education is distinctly, it's divorced from a promotional positioning of products. It is ensuring that the best knowledge about how drugs work is communicated to those who actually have to administer these. So, my observation, is it the best of times or is it the most infuriating of times? And the answer is yes and yes. Why is it the best of times? The pipeline is flush. Flush in ways I do not think anyone in 1999 would have imagined we could have gotten to. 1999 was a time of firing wooden bullets into, into combat. It was a disastrous time. If you can ever talk to an MSF physician who was working in Tanzania, or Malawi, or Mozambique in 97, 98, 99, the stories are heart-wrenching. 60% failure rates, meaning you're putting pills in kids' mouth knowing you have a less than one in three chance of them actually doing something. Horrific for everyone. And so today we're talking about drugs that hit 95% effective rates. Incredible. And so that's the best of times. And the pipeline, as you've seen, is a bouquet of different drugs for prevention, for severe, for uncomplicated. That's thrilling, and it has been life transforming, world transforming. So why is it the most infuriating of times? This is a slightly out of date, but it doesn't matter. The trend is real. What you see here is um, the growth of artemisinin combination treatment. So these are the workhorse drugs of uncomplicated malaria treatment. They're great. They're the ones that deliver 90, 95% effective cure rates. They've gone from 11 million, 76, rocketing up to over 200 million, and they've been hovering there north of 300 million treatments, quality assured ACTs being procured, not manufactured, but manufactured and sold every year. So that's awesome. That's one of the best of times because I know you can't do the math just like this, but if there's 210 million, 220 million cases a year, and almost 400 million treatments, we should all be saying, what's the big deal then? We're double the amount of people who are sick, so no one should be dying, right? Wrong. This is what's terribly wrong with the picture so far. What you see here is the estimated deaths from malaria nudging down on a very slow trajectory. Five, just under 500 million, mid 400s in 2016. So where we're at today in 2018, hovering around 430, 420, 430. The number doesn't matter, the specifics. 400,000, 400,000 people dying a year when we're having double the amount of drugs manufactured that actually need to be treating patients. So this is what keeps us awake at night, saying there's a flat tire somewhere along that continuum of lily pads that I was pointing out. And it's not a single one, unfortunately. It's a good question that Andrew asked the panelists, and each of their answers has a grain of truth in it. So our cry that gets us out of bed every day says, with an armamentarium of some of the best drugs for fighting and preventing malaria that we've ever had, we need to be doing a lot lot more. So today's celebration, today's a battle cry, today's a rallying cry. We're not there yet. We're far too far away from where we want to be. 
And so I'm just going to close with this reflection. It's not to put you guys in a bad mood or a downer because I think there are, <laughs> there are, there are things that are improving. But really, the work is beginning a new chapter of, of the march to try and address some of these gaps. And so on this road to impact, which David showed you earlier, and, and again, we live by this, all those different elements that we're considering, we're continually asking ourselves, are there other spaces, other places, other partnerships that we should be looking at to help make this happen? And so just a couple of observations and I'll close on these. Number one, um, malaria is a primary care disease, basically. If you get it right, if you nip it in the bud, if you prevent it, first of all, if you if doesn't, don't prevent it, it slips through the cracks, the net's not used, the chemo prevention doesn't work and someone gets it, you're still talking about a primary care disease which is as easy to treat, more or less, as a headache. If you can diagnose it and you have great drugs that cost 37 cents, what's the big deal? And so if it's not working a large part of the time, are we the only ones facing this problem? And I would say something quite obvious here, no. Obviously there's elements of supply chain and last mile delivery that are not unique to malaria programs or to drug development partners in malaria space. So where we do need to be looking across the supply chain is for universal health coverage, universal health access, we need to be soldiers arm in arm with everyone else trying to figure out how to solve last mile basic health system performance measures. And for the access team MMV, that is a challenge to ourselves to be pushing the envelope and doing more, not with just the usual customers or our partners in countries, but anyone working on the health system strengthening space. And people hear about health system strengthening, it kind of numbs their mind because it sounds like such a big, hairy, audacious goal. And yet it's absolutely at the nut of this question. The health system isn't performing. Malaria is going to be one of your bellwether indicators that something is broken. And the other thing I want to close on then is this. You see that little arrow that we've always drawn here that goes left to right. Or that little child in the middle that says, if we've done our job right, we get patient uptake, mission accomplished. Right? Right and wrong. The point of treating a patient is critical, but if we're not systematically capturing every patient encounter, and I mean they were diagnosed positive for malaria and they got treated, they were diagnosed negative for malaria and they got something else. If each encounter is not treated as a precious nugget of data, then we're missing the key paving stones on the road to impact. Because out of the patient encounter, what we can come away with Think about adding this up 10 million times a year in Uganda. If you start to see the full richness of data in that encounter, besides the diagnosis, patient history, and treatment, you're starting to see how well your supply chain is or isn't working, what are the pain points within your country, how the disease burden is flaring up or flaring down in different parts of the country, and ultimately, you're giving program management and Ministry of Health, the dashboard to drive their car, if you will, they can see the speed, the wind, the patterns, the gas tank levels. Without a dashboard of data to guide programs, they are driving blindfolded and it's never gonna work. So again, I hope that resonated with those of you who are paying attention to Ken's talk, but that whole notion of data and management as power is absolutely critical to actually pushing us to the next level up. And with that, I'll say we're very optimistic, but there's a lot of work ahead. And thanks to our panelists. Thanks, thanks George. And after that um, necessary reality check, we're now going to have a message, a little bit of optimism with a short film um, made with MMV's partners in Liberia called How Reagan Beat Severe Malaria. For a very long time, quinine was the, was the mainstay. The results are not as dramatic as that of uh, 
uh, injectable artisanate. It was really very urgent that a transition needed to be done to something more efficacy, but also operationally more feasible given our context of uh, uh, human resource and other resources constraints. The burden of malaria in Apache is great. As we look at the, the number of patients that we receive every day in the hospital, especially children under five and pregnant mothers, but generally the whole community. This week we saw over 100 cases of malaria, but about 50 were severe and admitted in the hospital. So about Reagan, when they came, they were really very sick. We received then sent to the lab. The results were positive, and that's why we admitted them. Uganda had just changed its policy from use of quinine to injectable testinate for um, treat, uh, treating severe malaria in the country. So the ISMO project came in handy uh, to one, uh, fill gaps in terms of commodity, uh, commodity supplies to ensure that there's availability of injectable testinate. But then also through the project, we're able to train health workers uh, on proper management of severe malaria using injectable testinate. So that helped improve their skills uh, on malaria, uh, severe malaria management. We are seeing the sign of anemia in him, mm -hmm. so I would wish to take the sample of the blood so that we take it to the laboratory for HB estimation. Since the end of the ISMO uh, project, the most important things were more acceptability of uh, injectable artusinate, more availability, better outcomes of severe malaria cases, and uh, less effects, side effects to, to the people. So the justification with this project was that the more people you treat with injectable artusinate, the more lives you save. 
So now that we are coming to the end of the project, we can see that the switch is effective. People are now using injectable adhesives rather than quinine. And in the hospitals, you can see by yourself how enthusiastic healthcare workers are about administering injectable adhesives to their patients. And they are reporting that the drug is effective and the drug is actually contributing to reducing the malaria mortality at the hospital level, which means the project has kept its promise. The country has been able to switch uh, completely from the use of quinine to injectable testnet, and then also we have been able to get partners uh, to fund the transition from ISMO uh, to continuously supply, um, procure uh, injectable testnet uh, for the country for the next three years and plus. Yeta ni inuti idaha talku isya ni inuti kiri par par kiri kuwa me ben yere kuwa pa jika peram kiri kuwa me ti idaha talku isya. Kami ayen yedu yang orang nung lingi ti yang orang nung dan tuh me peram yang wiritual. Kita muka doi cha endoi cha nado tunu pa jika ni kuwa me doi piyut.